to type in some of this, so I'm going to try and use this for you mic because um, you can't type with one hand very easily. Um, so my talk titled Fun with Gene Streamer Pipelines, and I'm going to have to look down over here because I can't mirror my screen at the moment. So sorry if I'm looking away from you. Um, First thing I need to tell you is that I'm not in any way associated with the GStreamer project. I haven't, well, that's a lie. I've committed one patch to GStreamer. Um, I'm not a professional or anything. Um, this is just a person who's played with GStreamer and found some cool things about how it works and wanted to share with you the effect of um, like what cool things you can do without even hacking to write any code. Um, there'll be a bit of command line in this um, kind of tutorial, um, but there is no coding needed. You can do all this stuff just in your shell. Um, so what is GStreamer? Um, GStreamer basically takes the what I call the Unix philosophy and what um, Wikipedia calls the Unix philosophy and applies it to multimedia. And that's basically the idea is you write one program to do one thing. Um, it's not like Microsoft Word, which you know even has like a flight simulator in there somewhere if you do something. Um, you make one thing that does one thing well, it does that, um, does only that, then you connect these components together and some type of pipeline. Um, in the Unix philosophy, it was all about a text pipeline. Um, the GStreamer philosophy is about connecting various multimedia or binary formats together. So there's a lot more negotiation and stuff that has to go on. It's not as simple as just standard text, but it, it's built the same way. You have these elements that only do one thing and one thing well, and then you connect them together into a pipeline. Um, the, so this is kind of an example of a GStreamer pipeline. Um, unlike text pipelines, you generally can have splits and joins because in multimedia, it's multimedia, not single media. Um, so in, this is kind of a pipeline and you've got kind of some the code here at the front that kind of then splits, and then you've got the audio stuff at the top and the video stuff at the bottom. Um, so towards the end of the talk, we'll be building a pipeline kind of like this, just on the command line. Um, so that's a pretty advanced pipeline. Um, GStreamer comes in a kind of weird set of um, packages. Um, the good one, that comes in, they call them plugin packages. Um, the good one is basically all your open source, free, unpainted, encumbered stuff that actually works really well. Your bad ones are generally um, um, kind of things that have yet to be fully developed um, and still kind of in a hacky stage. Um, the ugly ones are the ones that might pose problems if you're in, say, a country which has software patents and um, using these things might be painted and covered. So, um, you can run most of this stuff without ever using the ugly um, pipelines, but if you want to do things like H.264, which is patent encumbered, you're going to need the ugly set. Um, and the two tools we're going to be using today, uh, one of them is called GST Inspect. Um, GST stands for GStreamer. Um, it's a lot easier to type GST than GStreamer on the front of everything, so they should, that's what they're shortening that to. On most distros, it's actually GST inspect 0 0.10 if you're running like um, a Lucid, Precise, some Red Hats. Um, although 1.0 has been released in the last six months, so some of your newer systems might have a GST inspect 1.0. Um, the system's compatible in that you can have both systems installed at once. Um, so, um, GStream inspect basically lets you inspect the elements. It's kind of like the dash dash help of GStreamer. Um, you know when you type in command lines like find dash dash help gives you all the like what it does, a bit of description on each of the arguments and how they affect the output. Um, 
GST inspector is kind of the equivalent to that. Um, another way to think of maybe like a man, the equivalent of the man command. We can go man bind. Um, GStreamer is basically type GST, GST inspect space the name of the element and it will print you as much information as um, he can find about that element. Um, the last thing we're going to use is basically GST and launch, which is a thing that lets us build these pipelines on the command line. It's a simple little tool that you give it the list of elements together and it will start up and build that pipeline and then show you whatever output it is. Um, you don't need to do any programming, it's all just writing stuff in the ship. So, we're going to start with trying to play some sound. Um, GST launch um, basically takes a bunch of elements. Um, the first one we care about is the audio test source. This produces a kind of annoying buzz sound so you can test your audio. Um, then we're going to connect it together to um, an audio converter which basically converts from one format to another and then um, we connect it to an outer sync if you've got an outer thing or a pulse audio sync if you've got pulse audio and that's all really complicated and nobody really wants to know about any of that. Um, that have invented a thing called an auto audio sync um, that basically chooses the right one for your system um, so you don't have to worry about it. So our full pipeline is going to look like um, what I'm going to type out here. And this is live, so I'm going to get things wrong um, quite a lot, I expect. Um, so we take our GST inspect, then we go audio test source, and GStreamer uses basically the exclamation mark to connect the elements together, equivalent to like the pipe in shell. Um, so you press audio test source and then you go into audio convert and then you go into an auto audio sync. So if I hit enter here and I, sorry, that was GST inspect, I need a GST launch. But um, launch, not lunch. Um, you can see that it gave me all the information about the um, first module, which is an auto audio, well, actually the last module, sorry, the auto audio sync. Um, so if I run that, you get an annoying sound. Um, some of the later ones are probably going to need this sound, so let's see if... As I said, annoying sound. Um, so that's great for like annoying your sister or something like that, but um, it's not so useful as like I want to do something. Um, so if I go back here, um, decoding music. We've probably all got um, audio in either OG or MP3 format, and the way um, GStreamer kind of works is that first we take the file source. So if you think about it, the source is where it comes from and it ends up in an auto audio sync, like the previous tone. Um, so sync is where data exits Ustreamer. Um, but a file isn't just raw data um, about the audio. It needs to be decoded and encapsulated. So the first thing basically um, unencapsulates it, then decodes it to raw, then auto converts it to whatever your system needs in the auto audio sync. Um, so generally with pipelines, you're going to see it in a mux, then decode, and then convert. Um, but in that kind of step. Um, MP3 is strange for some unknown reason. I don't know why. Um, probably because it was taken and covered originally when GStream was developed, so it didn't have as many checks when this thing. So it's equivalent to um, basically demuxian, is an MP3 pass module. Then you pass the command, and then you've got your auto convert and your auto audio sync. Um, but that's kind of sucky in that I need to know what type of my file is first. And I need to remember that it's a bulk file and demux it, and that the thing in an file is decoded by Warbus. Um, that's the type of thing you don't really want to know. Um, so the GStreamer developers 
um, were basically said, we'll write that logic for you and created this thing called a decode bin 2. Um, there's a decode bin 1, but the 2 one's better. Um, <laughs> as by the high number. And basically, you can put anything into the code bin, and as long as you have plugins that understand that format, um, it will construct, basically, inside it, this pipeline here for you. So you don't need to worry about the audio formats. You can just use the code bin. And to prove that, I'm going to try another pipeline. So instead of audio test source, which was the um, one we were using before with that nine uh, annoying beep, um, we're going to go with a file source and it's location equals um, on tab complete. I'm not in the right folder. Okay, I need to get rid of that app. As you can see, this is all live, so I'm doing lots of mistakes. And so I can, this is an MP3 file, which I'm going to use in some later examples as well. So in theory, if I get that right, Yes. So, as you can see, it's decoding an MP3 um, and doing all the output the sound. Um, I can do OG files as well, just to prove I've got an OG file here. Oh, some telephones. Um, so, that kind of shows you that building kind of a basic media player is pretty simple. It doesn't have any skipping forward, back, you have to listen to the full song and then you have to select another one. Um, but, and that's kind of really pointless because if you wanted to just listen to your music, you put it in like your multimedia thing like Totem or Ribbonbox or whatever young kid people are using now. Um, so you'd use that. Um, so why the hell do you care about GStreamer pipelines? And the reason is because they have developed lots of cool little things that do cute things that you might want to do to your media if you're a bit more geeky. So um, people seem to like karaoke. I don't at all because I can't sing. Um, but people do like karaoke. The problem with karaoke is that um, there's already somebody singing that song, so you either need to get a version of the song which doesn't have the singer in it, or do something about it. And the um, GStreamer people decided to see if they could programmatically remove the voice. And that's what the audio karaoke plugin does. So if we go to this pipeline, and we put an audio karaoke. That's your dial phone. Uh, that doesn't have a voice in it. Harry Oki. I think I spelled that right. Check my dial tones as you were saying. That's the wrong file. Sorry, I did not understand what you were saying. So. So if you listen carefully, the voice, you can still kind of hear it but it's much more suppressed, so I could sing over the top of this. Um, the, re the reason <laughs> is that as quiet is because I turned down the volume on my computer so we don't double there. Um, and just to compare that to... Um, so that's something cool you can do with um, audio. And it can actually suppress audio from anything. So if you wanted to, you could, instead of having the first thing be an MP3 file, it could be, you know, a Jason Bourne movie or something like that. So you could have the whole movie without much speaking and dub over it yourself. So this is just a kind of cool little utility that um, 
you can do it. And because it's, in, it's just a little plug-in, you can basically pipe anything into it and pipe it out of, to anywhere. So um, it's really, really flexible. Okay, so that's karaoke. Um, you can also do echoes. Um, so, you know, those fancy sound cards have, you know, like, feel like you're in a marble cavern or something to your sound. Um, Gstream lets you do that type of thing. Um, I think I've already, no, that's an echo. I'm not going to try and type this one out. I have a cheat sheet. Because there's a lot of zeros in there. <laughs> and the theory. You can kind of hear now it's got an echo to it. It's more apparent when she starts singing. So, it's got an echo to it. And the echo plugin is actually quite advanced. Um, if you do a GST inspect of audio echo, and I'll have to zoom out a bit more. You can see that it has like intensity, feedback, um, delays, all that type of thing. Um, the there are a bunch of other plugins like Audio Echo called like stereo positioning, so you can position the audio in different locations and stuff like that. And you just basically dump it into your pipeline and give it a couple of arguments. So here we've got basically. See, it says it takes a delay, that takes a delay in nanoseconds, but no why in nanoseconds. That's why we need like a bazillion zeros on the end of here. And this is how you set a property. So you think the delay is, um, I don't know, 500 milliseconds, maybe. I don't do these calculations in our head. That's what like typing the Google Translate box thing is. <laughs> um, so that is another audio thing. Um, you might be wondering why I had a DTMF dialing of thing. That's because you can do other cool things like detect DTMF tones in your input video. So if you ever wondered, you know, when Jason Bourne's dialing a number, <laughs> what number that is he's dialing, um, you can use this to do so. And just to prove um, that it works, I'm going to use my GST launch command again. And you can see that I put an additional dash M here. That basically means that um, after any message events that occur on the bus, the um, DTMF detect will basically output the message every time it detects a um, audio tone in the DTMF range. So you can see that as each one is detected, um, it does that. And again, because it's just a plug-in into um, GStreamer, you can put like your movie at the beginning and then put the DTMF detector in the middle, which means if anybody has like DTMF tones in their movie, you can find out what they're typing. Um, this is actually apparently pretty cool because um, a bunch of movies have like messages in those various tones and stuff, so you can now like geek out on your favourite movie and find out what all the secret hidden things that the audio engineer has put in there. Um, probably things like spelling rude words and stuff like that, knowing <laughs> audio engineers, but um, <laughs> yep. So that was basically audio, but there's a whole other range of things um, called video. And again, you can see it's very, very similar. Um, you basically <coughs> need an auto video converter, which converts the video format into whatever format your system takes. And then you need something like an X image thing or a VXV image thing if your hardware's got special hardware to decode video. Um, but again, that's all kind of painful, so you could just use an auto video sync, which will automatically detect if you're like on X, or, or you've got GL support or something, and just choose the best one. 
Um, and as well, to test our video pipeline is working, um, we use a video test source, which basically outputs the test pattern to the video. Um, so let's do that. <coughs> So I take a video test source and I give it a pattern and then I go um, auto video convert and then uh, auto video. Um, why it's auto video convert rather than video convert is because there are multiple different ways you can convert video. Um, with audio it's just taking one audio type and transferring it to other one. With this one, it might be scaling it up and down, changing the color format, changing the frame rate. Um, so that's why this is a lot more complicated. But you can see this is a nice default pattern. Um, if you want to test what your pipeline does with the snow, um, there's also, if I change this, that's, you know, in the standard SMPT, I can't remember. Um, what, which way around the acronym is, um, but you can see that's the standard test pattern. Okay. Um, so that's how you basically do video. So um, most MP3 players let you visualize your um, audio, so this also lets you visualize your audio. There's about 30 different plugins for different visualization schemes. So you can see that basically, oh no, you can't see it because I did that in the wrong window. Um, you can see it's visualizing that song. Um, the problem is we're no longer hearing that song. And that's because um, basically this takes audio in and outputs video. It doesn't have an audio output. Um, so what we need to do is basically use a T operator. Um, T is because it kind of looks like a T duck, it comes in one side and goes out two different ways. Um, so this is how we could get our visualization and audio. Um, this is also important because in later stages we're going to have to deal with audio and video at the same time, so we know how, need to know how to route them. Um, basically when you're doing pipeline, you give the elements a name, so in this case I've named it T, and then to split the pipeline, so this is the top pipeline, you put two spaces, and then you go T dot, that means like the, one of the outputs. So I'm sending that to the audio, then I do another two spaces, and I send it um, to the video. Um, because the video and audio are decoding um, at different speeds, we also need to put a Q in, which basically gives them a separate thread. Um, so if we take that, and go back here. That one's still the wrong one. Take that and paste it here. Now I've got music and visualization. Um, and there's a bunch of them. There's one called um, Goom 2K, I believe. Nope. 2K1, maybe. So it's a different visualization method. Um, there's some interesting ones there that can actually give you real information about your video rather than just look, or your sound rather than just looking pretty. Um, and you can also use that to see what happens to your audio when you put it through, say, something like an audio karaoke filter. You can see what it's cutting out in the output. So the two spaces are actually syntactically important. Yes. And how does that get through back? Um, I don't know how it gets through Bash. You used to have to escape both spaces, um, but it seems to have figured out that figured out some way to make it work. Um, maybe magic is a super one. Yeah, <laughs> magic. As I said, I'm not a G-Streamer developer, so I can't tell you what it actually does. But um, yeah, it works. I'm a G-Streamer. I just never realised that these spaces were important. I guess I'd always copy and paste it whenever those. Yeah, um, often you can use this a new line, a space in a new line is what they often use instead, um, which is also like two white space characters. Um, 
Yeah, and that's speed <coughs> schema. Um, there, now, um, so decoding video, video comes with both video and audio. So you can see that um, I've got a MUX, which basically splits the audio and video, and then I connect one of the MUXs out to the Aura decoder, and one of them out to Warbus decoder. Um, because Warbus is the audio side, and the Aura is the video side of the MUX file. Um, so I've got that as well. And it's the audio just conventional? The audio doesn't matter because it's um, able to understand that um, they will understand that it has two outputs. Um, one of them can only detect the video things, one of them can only detect the audio things. So it detects what it's doing with the Yes. Um, so basically, if this was more complicated in that it had multiple possible outputs that could go to multiple different locations and you needed to you know, switch them about, you actually have to go mux dot the pad name. Um, so that's normally um, something like audio or video or something like that. Okay. Um, but it, when you just mark it around here, it generally gets things right. So John just kind of like, you work it out? Yes. Okay. Um, normally you have to give a name up the dot. Okay. Um, so this is just one of the Blender open source movies. Um, as you can hear, I'm getting both sound and video out of the time. Um, so you can make the media player. Um, so again, you can use a decode bin rather than having to figure out what like whether you're an old file or things, and then the code bin makes everything so much simpler. And basically, you get two outputs again, the audio and the video one. Um, so, I used to code bin. Code bin's awesome. Um, so, the reason why you might do this is because um, you're kind of an old timer and don't like all these crystal clear video things that are happening these days. So, you can put something like an aging TV <coughs> effect. Oops, where did I put it? I put no, that's the auto video sync, auto video convert. What's the actual aging TV? That's problem is I can't see if that's right. If it doesn't work, put in an auto, another auto video converter. Um, so not all sinks um, can talk, not all sinks and sources can talk to each other. So if you get stuck like that, basically just whack another converter in there. <laughs> if, it doesn't, if it doesn't need to do anything, it basically disappears. So having too many of them is not a bad thing. Um, having lots of them um, helps you work around those problems like that. And as you can see, now we have our kind of old aging TV. Well, it's called aging TV, so having a time traveling view. Um, and there are other effects you can do, like um, there's one called ripple, or not, water ripple. So now I've got a lovely water ripple destroying our image. <laughs> uh, so these are probably more interesting if you chain them together in you know some other way rather than you know totally destroying the video. Um, but just to prove that they all work together, I can take an auto uh, water ripple and make it a um, aging to B. Now we've got a water ripple on our aging TV. So, um, you can do some interesting things here. Um, there are about 500 plugins um, available for Ustreamer now, so you can do 
quite a wide variety of modifications to your video. Uh, no, that one's too bad. Um, and just to prove that it all works, um, so with other files is that um, I've got a, no, that's the stranger. I've got a Matroska 447. Uh, so uh, we can use the Matroska 723 file. Turns out computers these days are a lot more powerful. Um, you used to have to put like each one of these pipelines on an individual machine, uh, each stage in the pipeline on an individual machine, but now my year old laptop can do them um, do them and if I do that you can now get we have made a start to move in four, three, two, one I think some of the coolest things, which are also kind of creepy, is um, base layer. So you can basically put in your pipeline a thing that will blur the base of people with text in the video. Um, and although it's called base blur, it basically takes what's called an OpenCV um, Harris page or something, I don't know how to pronounce it, but there's a whole bunch of different profiles. Some of them will detect the person on the front, some will detect them on the side, some will do both, some will do things like detect drinking bottles and blur the label of the drinking bottle. So the blur is called face blur. Um, it doesn't actually have to be um, just faces. And again, I just go in here and go face blur. And this is a rather new plugin, so it's only available in the um, So even if you hate them, you know, um, <laughs> you haven't lost much of your life. Um, the other thing you can do is just face detection. If you don't actually want to blur the faces, just figure out where the faces are. Um, maybe you've got like a seven hour surveillance video of the front of your yard and a bunch of kids take your house. Then you could basically say, detect where the faces are in this video. Or you know you've got squirrels stealing your bird feed. Again, you can give it basically a ha which detects things like squirrels, and then it will tell you where in your film the squirrels appear. Um, so that's a kind of cool thing I think personally. Um, and for all your terminal junkies out there, I thought I'd better show you this one. Uh, let's get rid of the. Thank <laughs> you. 
So this is basically the ASCII version of the video. The creation of the world It works slightly better on the other video. I'll show you that one. Don't really recognize this part, but when you get it to that third part, um, it's pretty, you can understand what's going on. Yeah, there's our bird. And there it goes. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, if you've got, I don't know, a computer from the 1980s that can't display anything but um, same video about cool, so that would be 160 holiday. Yeah, um, you can also. Um, uh, I haven't got it in the. I forgot to copy into my cheat sheet. You can make it so the font size is about four pixels size and make the screen like the screen a thousand pounds by a thousand pounds. You can actually see what's happening on the screen quite well. I have no idea why you'd want to do that, but people have. <laughs> um, So Kaka works very well in the terminal. Um, it's a crazy project. They have even the OpenGL accelerator. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, uh, so if you're interested in doing this, there are a couple of um, interactive editors which actually let you, you know, Lego block style. You drop a block here and a block here, and then you draw like a line between them. I haven't used them, so I can't tell you if they're any good. Um, I know at least one of them crashes regularly, um, but I can't tell you which one. <laughs> um, so, 50-50 chance there. Um, as well, all both of these will output basically the command line version of the pipeline. So, if you've got one that you're happy with, you copy and paste, you can dump in the command line. And lastly, um, there are a bunch of ways to get video in and out. Um, if you have access to the live event stuff on uh, YouTube or Justin TV, you can use something like an RTP and sync to basically dump the video into their video system. Um, this is basically sends a flash content up to a video server, and that's what all these um, you know video <coughs> distribution sites normally do with their little you know flash widget on. Things. All you have to do is figure out the URL where the dumping data is and then you can use the RTMP, RTMP sync. And it has a bunch of options which let you configure it for various services um, like YouTube or, or Justin TV or those kinds of things. And you might just place into this better from the lawyer. Well, if you do something that's only for content, you're not going to get one in theory. Um, so that's my talk. Um, as you can see, you can do some pretty interesting things with um, GStreamer. I highly recommend other people check it out. And if you are interested in doing audio, uh, audio, video, anything like that in your um, application, I highly recommend taking a look at GStreamer. It's not a Linux only thing. It runs on Windows, it runs on Mac, it runs on Android. Um, pretty much everywhere. Um, it's really, really powerful. Um, I highly recommend you use it. Thank you. Yeah.